Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready. CNN, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station. Uh, Houston, this is Station, yes. Please call Station for a voice check. Uh, it's a voice check. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, we hear you loud and clear. This is station. Fantastic. Thank you. We are in a commercial break. We will be live in one minute. Our first question is to Katie. Thirty-five seconds to live. Fifteen seconds. As you know, we've been following astronaut Katie Coleman's journey to space this past year. She's been on board the International Space Station now for almost four months, and we wanted to find out what it's like up there. So Katie joins us now live from the International Space Station, 220 miles above the Earth, along with Commander Dmitry Kondratyev, Flight Engineers Paolo Naspoli, Ron Garan, Andrei Borisenko, and Alexander Samokutyev. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see you. Uh, Katie, you, you welcomed <laughs> on uh, Wednesday evening. I don't know how you guys keep time up there, but on Wednesday evening, you welcomed some new guests uh, to the International Space Station. Tell us about that and how it's going up there. You know, it is so nice to have these guys up here. I think when, we, when we're up here for a long time, we actually begin to take it just a little bit for granted. And when new people come and, and they're so excited about being here, and it re reminds us of all the things that are just unique, looking out the window, floating, and, uh, and just ev loving every minute of living almost on a different planet. Uh, my next question is to flight engineer Ron Guerin. I want to ask you uh, about a warning that we heard last week that the you know, headlines that maybe there was a piece of space junk that you guys were on the lookout for for the International Space Station. At first, NASA warned of a potential evacuation, but clearly nothing, uh, nothing came of that. You get a little nervous up there with all that space junk? <laughs> Well, no, we've got uh, many people on the ground that track all that, and so they, uh, they keep us advised when anything gets close, and we have procedures. We could uh, take shelter in our Soyuz spacecraft if, uh, if something gets too close, or if need be, we can move the station. We can boost it to a higher, higher orbit or you know, do other maneuvers to get mm -hmm. uh, out of the way of anything that might be coming our way. Mm -hmm. Katie, I want to ask you about this uh, uh, flute duet that we, we saw a little bit of. Our viewers saw a little bit of. We'll show them a little bit more. Uh, you recently made history by playing the first ever space earth flute duet. Uh, you did it with the Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. This is fascinating. I don't even know how you, how you worked that all out, but tell us about this. Well, there's a delay in the communication, which makes it actually quite uh, challenging for us. And uh, and so what we had to do was he recorded on the ground the the bass track, you know, the sort of the the guitar rhythm and things like that. And uh, we agreed what we would play. And then I recorded to that track up here, sent my flute track down there. And then uh, he's actually playing these in uh, concerts in Russia this week, where he he sees me on the video and playing, and he plays along with me. So it's the way that we worked out to uh, play together. And I think it just shows that music is universal and that real people live up here. And we, we have hobbies and things that we love just like people down on Earth. 
uh, it's truly amazing that we're even speaking to you uh, all. Flight Engineer Paolo Nespoli, I wanted to ask you that, um, you know, last Tuesday was the 50th anniversary of, uh, of man's first journey into space, the 30th anniversary of the first space shuttle launch. What does it all mean to you guys to be up there together from different countries, um, astronauts and cosmonauts who are, uh, you know, together in space ex exploration? Well, uh, the month of April, it's a very important month. It's also my birthday, so, but, uh, um, no, it's, uh, it, 50, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, the humankind kind of leap uh, forward uh, outside of this world, and, uh, and the, 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 the journey, the exploration has uh, continued then and uh, keep uh, bringing, bring us and, pushes us uh, forward. This is one of our the things that we do and uh, we do best. Uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting how all together we can feel uh, like a, a, a human race, uh, not anymore a, any single country. And it's very nice and fascinating that all these uh, countries up here on the station, but also and uh, overall on the ground can work together and build something then transcend uh, boundaries and, and societies and pushes us over. This is uh, really nice. Hey, flight engineer Ron Guerin, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of parents watching us right now in the morning getting ready for work, uh, and their kids are no different than we were as kids, uh, saying that they wanted to go into space and become astronauts. But the space program is changing so much. Pretty soon it'll be commercial vessels uh, shuttling astronauts to things like the International Space Station. Uh, can kids still dream of being, being astronauts, and what, what will it be like 20 years from now? What will, what will kids who decide to be as astronauts be doing, Ron? Yeah, of course, uh, kids can still dream of becoming astronauts. And, you know, hopefully, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, NASA and the other government agencies want to get out of the business of low Earth orbit. And we want to go beyond that. We want to explore further and further into the solar system. And that's what, you know, the big organizations, big governmental organizations do best. They can push the, the engine uh, of the envelope. And that's what I, I see, you know, the astronauts in the future doing. And just as you said, you know, hopefully very soon, Going to low Earth orbit will be no different than getting on an airplane and flying to a different c country or you know flying somewhere uh, else in the world. It'll be commonplace, and so hopefully when that happens, you know we will see further and further exploration, and we'll always have room. You know the universe is a really big place, so we'll always have some place to explore. Good. Well, you guys stay safe up there. Great talking to you, Ron, Katie, Paolo, uh, Dimitri, Andre, and Alexander. Good luck up there. Bye, everybody. All right, NASA announcing later today. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the CNN portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from the New York Times. Station, this is the New York Times. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Great, thank you. Um, so my first question is for everyone. It's sort of a big picture question. Um, today is, of course, the 50th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight and the 30th anniversary of the first shuttle flight. Um, today is also the day that Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, will announce which museums the shuttles will end up after they're retired. Um, space exploration seems to have slowed down and it's not as, as much at the forefront. And I was wondering if you all could reflect on the last 50 years and talk about your role in the space station and the history of humanity moving out into space. Well, today we're recognizing the fact that 50 years ago, humankind first left our planet to explore beyond the Earth. And it's just the first step. And what's interesting to me is that these, these very big first steps, like the ones we're celebrating here in April, are, are actually made up of, very, of, of lots and lots of very small steps. And without the small steps, there are no big steps. And uh, the, the fact that now we live on, an, on the space station together, the six of us, and that it seems a little bit normal to us and our families that we're going to spend six months up here, to me, that means that uh, we've taken something that's a very large step, and it becomes a small small step. And so I'm looking forward to the future when, you know, we, we use the things that we're learning here on the International Space Station to be able to proceed safely and knowing what we're doing out to places like the moon and to Mars and to explore further our universe. Okay. Um, 
This is again for a question for anyone who wants to take it. Um, what's a typical day like? Like, what's a typical day like on ISS? Well, uh, we have been here uh, four months, and I don't think we had a typical day as yet. Uh, uh, I mean, normally we wake up around uh, six, uh, six thirty, have a first uh, talk to the ground around seven thirty. And then we work all the way to 7.30 in the evening with a break for lunch. Um, and uh, we can do, in, in, during the working day, we can do all sorts of uh, things. Uh, uh, usually about 50% uh, of the time is uh, spent in uh, maintaining the spacecraft, uh, space station. 30% uh, around 30% uh, doing uh, science of experiment, and uh, the rest uh, for uh, physical fitness uh, and uh, little other things that we need to do around the station here. So that's uh, that's your typical day, but but it's really different. I mean, uh, one day can be dedicated to uh, planning for a spacewalk. Uh, the other day it's a big day for an experiment going. Uh, third day uh, something breaks and everybody has to fix that thing, otherwise we cannot keep going. So it's uh, very interesting. And of course, once in a while we stop a little bit and try to look outside and uh, enjoy our planet. Okay. Um, and, and I was just going to add okay. that... Um, Oops. I was just going to add that, you know, the looking outside and enjoying the planet, sometimes we get really busy inside, and, and in fact, to make sure that we, I get everything done inside, sometimes I just think, you know, I'm not going to look out the window. But it is, uh, it is so almost addicting and just a, a tangible thing where you just, you look out the window, you see the earth, and it just does something to your whole self. And it's really hard not to do, and I, and I think, I, I, in fact, I know I would get a lot more sleep up here if we didn't have the ability to look down at the earth, because it is so, so beautiful and absolutely fascinating. I mean, if you look with a long lens, you can actually see details of what's going on on the ground, and it, it's just irresistible. Um, what's the most unexpected thing you've discovered about living in space? Well, uh, one of the things is that y you, you get up here and you tend to do things the way you do it on Earth. And uh, and so you start placing your stuff, uh, start working, and things don't work. I mean, microgravity is a w really weird environment. And one of the things that really struck me is that uh, uh, you have two hands and you can track only a few items, two or three items, not more, because that's what you can hold. And, and everything else floats away. So you're in the middle of doing something and you're missing pieces and you cannot find things anymore. Suddenly you have, uh, I mean, you have something one moment and you don't find it anymore. And of course, on the ground, you can hear them falling on the floor. Here you don't hear anything. They just float away and they disappear. It's kind of funny because you know you don't see them. You look around, cannot find them, and then five minutes later you turn around and it's sitting here. This big, big piece of this tool is just hovering here beside you, and you've been looking for it for 15 minutes. Um, another thing, uh, very quickly, we 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 had a table here, and where we eat, we would eat all together, uh, and and we had a. a, a we had a problem because the table was kind of put in a flat position and we cannot all fit. And it took us really uh, several weeks before we figured out that we could tilt the table and make it almost vertical so it's in front of us because here things don't fall off the table. They just stay there. Actually, you have to, you have to Velcro them to the table. Otherwise, they don't stay at all. And, and this concept here takes time before it settles in. But when it settles, it's, it's very nice. Um, the next question is for Catherine Coleman. Um, you're coming back to Earth next month. Have you thought about what you'll be doing next? Well, I would say no. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been so involved in being here, and besides just getting back to my family and uh, you know seeing my son and my husband and and uh, maybe just uh, asparagus season in Massachusetts, I'm looking forward to. I hadn't uh, really thought really further past uh, the debriefings that we do when we get home. We, we like to take a lot of notes and, and 
and try to think of things that could make uh, getting ready for the space station more efficient or even operating the space station more efficient. And when we come home, we spend several weeks actually talking with all the different disciplines about what our experience was really like. Because that's one of the challenges that we have up here is that we have our own little world, but often it's hard to communicate what life is really up uh, like for us to the people on the ground who are actually organizing our life and directing all the tasks that need to be done. And so our job is to communicate to them you know, what life is like so that they can most effectively um, give us the plan because they're the ones who have the knowledge to make the plan. Um, will you be looking to sign for another trip to ISS? I would, I would love uh, another trip to ISS, and I'm actually not. Uh, you said a month. I thought, oh no, only a month. I'm, I'm just not quite ready to come home. Okay. Um, this is for Ron Garen. Um, I know you got there, but I guess the same question. Um, will you be looking to do another trip on the, to ISS, do something else in NASA, or look for something outside of NASA? Yeah, well, I, I just got here, so you probably need to ask me in about five months. But uh, I, I think what my answer will be is if I'm needed to. I, you know, we've got a long list of people who haven't had this experience yet. So uh, if if there was a need for me to do it, certainly I would I would uh, love to do that, that again. But I also, you know, we need to we need to spread the experience uh, as much as we can. Um, and this is, I guess it's for Ron and Catherine. Given that there's no longer going to be a shuttle and there's fewer people going to the station or into space, do you still encourage young people to be astronauts? Yeah, I, I'm, you know, we do a lot of speaking to, um, to to various groups, including a lot of children. And you know, what I always tell them is to to that they can achieve whatever it is they set their mind to. And if that is, you know, to become an astronaut, then yeah, of course. And you know, we are retiring the space shuttle, but we are going to have something uh, down the line. We are going to continue. We're not giving up on exploration. There's always going to be uh, somewhere to explore. There's always going to be a need for that. And if if you know, kids have, you know, they naturally have that you know, exploration uh, mindset. And so, you know, that's something that we can, it should encourage and we should nurture. And, you know, hopefully they carry that through their adulthood. And um, if, if they would like to, to become astronauts, that, that's certainly within the realm of possibilities. Okay. Uh, this is my last question, and for anyone and everyone. Um, what will you miss most when you leave the station? No, I, I will miss the the floating, and just uh, as Paolo was explaining, you know, learning to adapt to this environment and and just uh, how to get from place to place. Uh, you know, when we're first here, we sort of grab onto things and move ourselves around, and once we get used to the place, then it just takes the touch of a finger to send you directly to where you want to go, and and it's just uh, this delicious, you know, fascinating feeling like Peter Pl Peter Pan, and I will miss uh, just living in a and sort of moving in a, in a unique way in a unique world. Great. Thank you all. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.